in the book of Genesis, it tells us that the world was beautiful and perfect. Man and God had perfect communion with each other. God would commune with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This was, I'm sure, one of his favorite things to do. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. And we see this encounter. Now, this is after the fall of Adam and Eve, but we're going to see here that this was not the first time God showed up to commune with them. This would be an occurrence that was on a regular basis, even before the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? So again, what we see here in, in, in the Hebrew, in the, in the original, that this, this communion with his prized creation was on a regular occurrence. This was not something that was just for the first time seen here. And they were astonished that God was walking in the garden. And that this time, it was different from all the other times. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, she makes this crystal clear. She says on page 50 of Patriarchs and Prophets, the holy pair were not only children under the fatherly care of God, but students receiving instruction from the all-wise creator. They were visited by angels and were granted communion with their who? With their maker with no obscuring veil in between. This was a regular occurrence. She then says in page 57 of the same book, in their innocence and holiness, again, before they sinned, they had joyfully welcomed the approach of their Creator. But now, they fled in terror and sought to hide. Are you with me? This was God's joy. I'm sure it wasn't just Adam and Eve's joy, but it was God's joy. And we're going to see at the end of the message that joy will return for both parties. Amen. We don't know how much time passed before God's command not to eat of the tree of life, uh, of the tree of good and evil. And their fall, we don't know, we know it didn't happen the next day, but we don't know exactly the time period. Probably wasn't too long after. God enjoyed, loved to walk, communicate, spend time, and be with Adam and Eve. I love how Mrs. White says that he was like a father, enjoying to spend time with his children. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to spend time with my kids. Now, when they get to teenagers, I don't know what I, how, how I'll feel about that, but right now I do. <laughs> I love to spend time with them, and they love to spend time with me. God loves to spend time and be around his children. But the Bible tells us that God's children went against God's counsel and they sinned, Adam and Eve were driven from the garden so they wouldn't eat from the tree of life. We find that in Genesis chapter 3 beginning in verse 22. Just stay with me. The Bible then says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of what tree? The tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim on the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. But before he did this, he let them know 
that because of the sin issue that had now entered the world and the result of their disobedience, pain and suffering now would be the everyday occurrence on earth. And he illustrates this by a sacrifice. Look at verse 21 of Genesis 3. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and did what? Clothed them. And we know that for God to make tunics of skin, something had to die. An animal died. And this sacrifice of this blood being shed was a symbol or an illustration of what would come on the cross, that God would himself die for humanity. Okay, this should be simple biblical knowledge. Are you with me? But here's the point. Here's the thing. The cross, which this sacrifice was a symbol of, that Christ would die eventually there on the cross, the cross is a symbol of pain and suffering. Look at this. Humanity would suffer and have pain, but God would suffer as well with them. This is such a radical concept that God would not, would not allow his children to suffer. He says, I will suffer with them. The God of the universe would also suffer with humanity. On the screen here, not yet. The cross is a symbol of pain and suffering. Okay, I have read that, sorry. Though Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, God did not abandon humanity, but we see humanity have encounters with God starting with Cain and Abel, then Noah and Abraham and Jacob and the children of Israel. Though his people were going through difficult times, though they were suffering, God was there, aware, listening, and he heard their cries. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry. And because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God is not blind to the suffering and sorrows of his people. Amen. God did not stay away from his people after they sinned. He continued with them. He had encounters with them. And even in Egypt, God says, I hear you. I hear your cries. I hear, I know your sorrows. And the Bible says God never changes. Amen. Therefore, he still hears the cries of his people. He still feels the sorrow of his people. Hallelujah. Now, what I'm going to show you is fantastic and incredible. After God delivered his people from Egypt, he brought them by, to the borders of the promised land, and what was the name of that land called? Starts with a C, Canaan. Look at this. But God's people rebelled and refused to trust God to deliver them from the giants. You might know that story, yes? God leads them all the way, took them to Mount Sinai, then leads them right there to the very doorstep of the land flowing with milk and honey. And the Bible then says that God sent spies to spy out the land. And they returned with a positive or negative um, uh, uh, announcements. Negative. Only two. Who were they? Caleb and Joshua had a positive report. Are you with me? But the majority listened to the majority there, and they rebelled. And God then said, if you are 20 years old and older, you will not enter the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua will. And you will spend 40 years. How long? 40 years in the wilderness. Now, here's the powerful theme that we see here. If you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 78. Take a look at this. God had said, right there at the doorstep of the promised land, because of your rebellion, you, anyone 
older than 20 years will not enter the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua will, and you will spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. I'm going to say it again. They will spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. But in Psalm 78, look what God, the Bible tells us beginning in verse 14. Psalm 78, beginning in verse 14. Take a look at this. Are we there? And the Bible says, in the daytime, also he, God, led them with the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the where? In the wilderness, and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like the rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat, food for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious, so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came against Israel. Verse 22, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation, yet he, did, yet he had commanded the clouds above, and he opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat, and given them the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food, and he sent them food to the full. Now look at verse 40. It then says in verse 40, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Look. <laughs> God leads them all the way to the where? Where were the doorsteps at? The promised land or Canaan. There they were. And because of their rebellion, God says, mm -mm, not going to enter like that. And you will spend 40 years in the where? Starts with a W, wilderness. And the Bible says that in the wilderness, God provided for them. Here it is. God did not stay in Canaan and say, I'll see you in 40 years. Hope all goes well. He went with them in the wilderness. He didn't abandon them. He didn't say, I'll see you in 40 years for those who are going to come in. I'll see you, Caleb. No, no. He went with them. He went with them. Though they rebelled against him, he still went with them. This is the true God of the universe, a God who never abandons his people. Look at this. God went through it with them every step of the way. That's why the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. But what can man do to me? In Matthew, Jesus says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And the word amen there means it is true. I agree. You see? Go to Daniel 2 very quickly. Take a look at this. All the other so-called gods that others worshipped were distant and were never to be looked as being with their people. We see that in Daniel chapter 2 here. Look at what the pagan astrologers and sorcerers say in Daniel chapter 2 verse 11. Take a look at this. What a contrast this is by the true God who didn't wait there in Canaan for his people to return later, but went with them every step of the way in the wilderness. 
In Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 11. The Bible says it is a difficult thing that the king requests. There is no other uh, who can tell the king, uh, tell it to the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Do you see that? All of these false gods were the gods that were sort of up there, away from humanity, away from the sufferings, away from the pain. They were there as the gods, and then the humanity was sort of down here uh, by themselves. But the true God we see in the Bible did not just kick Adam and Eve out and just stay there. He had encounters with them. He led them. He loved them. He ministered to them. And then in the wilderness there, at the, at the promised land there, at the borders, as they rebelled against God, he didn't say, I'll see you in 40 years for some of you. No, no. He went with them in the wilderness. God always is with his people Always, that's the true God. And no matter what man tries to do, God is more powerful than man. And he can make and get his people through no matter any situation. Amen. Here we go. Look at this on the screen. We see this concept of God not being separate from his creation in their sufferings throughout the Bible. But the ultimate affirmation of this concept of God's love was seen in the life and death of Jesus. The cross does not answer all the problems. Suffering remains, but the Bible shows us, here it is, that we have a God who crossed the abyss and planted his cross among the crosses of the earth. The cross is a symbol of pain and suffering. And God's ultimate demonstration of his love for man is, not only will you suffer, I'm going to now come and suffer just like you have. In the book Desire of Ages, we're told this in the spirit of prophecy. The thieves crucified with Jesus were placed on either side, one and Jesus on the midst, in the midst, in the what? In the midst of the two crosses. This was done by the direction of the priests and rulers. Christ's position between the thieves was to indicate that he was the greatest criminal of the three. Thus was fulfilled the scripture. He was numbered with the transgressors. But the full meaning of their act the priests did not see. As Jesus crucified with the thieves was placed in the midst. So his cross was placed in the midst of a world lying in sin. And the words of pardon spoken to the penitent thief kindled a light that will shine to the earth's remotest bounds. Someone once said that Christ went through it for us so he could go through it with us. In your hurts, you might have been tempted to think that God has forgotten you, but he hasn't. Go to Isaiah 49. Take a look at this. The God we serve also came to suffer with his children and to be with them through their times in the wilderness. Amen. This concept of the true God, the living God, is a concept that will change one's lives to know that the true God, the living God, never abandons his people and goes through it with them and has suffered with them as well. Amen. In the book of Isaiah chapter 49, look at verses 15 and 16. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16, the Bible says, Can a woman forget her nursing child Can not, and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. That is a sad thing. Did you know that there are mothers 
who forget about their children, and really there are mothers who abandon their children. This happens in this world. Are you with me? Unfortunately. So it can happen, right? But look what God says. Yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. You see, did you know, look at this, that after Jesus resurrected from the grave, from the tomb, the scars on his hands, side and feet, and in his brow still remain? Did you know that? You should know that, right? Because after his resurrection, the Bible says that he told them, hey, touch me here and my side and look at the scars. Look what it's saying here, that even today, every time God sees the scars on his hands, he has you on his mind. The God of the universe who wouldn't abandon his children, who would go through it with them in the wilderness, and then as they suffered, he says, I'm going to suffer as well. And every time I look at these scars, I think of my children. This is incredible. In verse 16 it says, I have inscribed. The word there means to engrave, not to write, engrave permanently. We are always in the mind of God. Through the hurts, He is right there. You in your totality, your hurts, pains, difficulties, joys, every time God opens His hands, you are before Him and on your mind. Let me remind God's people of this in the book, Great Controversy, one reminder alone remains. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of His crucifixion. Upon His wounded head, upon His side, His hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. And the tokens of His humiliation are His highest honor. Through the eternal ages, the wounds of Calvary will show forth his praise and declare his power. The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds to the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of the heaven, of heaven, but he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man, that he bore the guilt and shame of sin and the hidden, hidden of his father's face till the woes of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. That the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all uh, uh, destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. As the nations of the saved look, up, look upon their Redeemer and behold the eternal glory of the Father shining in His countenance, as they behold His throne, can we go back one? As they behold His throne, which is from the everlasting to everlasting, and know that His kingdom is to have no end, they break forth in rapturous song. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God by His own most precious blood. You see, you've probably read this verse before. They shall see His face and His name shall be on their forehead. And you have probably selfishly have said to yourself, Oh, I can't wait to see the face of Jesus. I can't wait to be there. 
literally standing before my Savior, and that's right to say. But listen carefully. Nobody longs that as much and even probably, probably more uh, uh, than God does. God longs for us to be with him face to face again, more I'm sure than you might. Are you hearing me? We hear that verse and we read it. Oh, we shall see his face. But you know, do you know who longs to see us in our face again personally? It's God himself. He will have joy, happiness to see his people. Do you know how much joy? Take a look at this in Zephaniah. Look at this. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He, God, will rejoice over you with singing. God will sing. Did you hear that? God will sing over joy because his children are home. God will sing. Who can't wait to hear God sing? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God will sing. Man, life is difficult. But I'm so glad that I don't have to go through it alone. Though the world might forsake me, my God won't. And not only that, he suffered. He suffered as well. Friends, the Bible says no ear has heard, no eyes have seen what God has prepared for his people. There's going to be more joy than words can describe. But again, we see that there will be if not more joy in the heart of God, so much joy when his children are finally with him again that he will sing out of gladness and joyfulness. God will sing. So no matter what you're going through, Do you want to claim this promise that God is near, though feelings might say otherwise? And he will see you through. What else are you going to do? Either you're going to put your hand, your life in the hands of a God who has promised to be with you and help you through in the wilderness and has also suffered. Or you can choose to tell God you'll go through it alone. That's up to you. But God wants to go through it with you. He wants to say, Lord, I need you and want you to go through life and difficulties with me. Anybody here? Amen.